Hello and welcome to the Startups of London podcast. I'm your host Ozan and the founder of Startups of London. Today, I'm joined by Camille Lejeur, co-founder and CTO of Work With Data. It is workwithdata.com. And I was just uh, checking their website. They define their mission as changing the way people interact with data and making it more positive for everyone. And uh, in a way, helping the openness of, of, of data, I think. And I, I, I like this idea. I think that like, it's hugely idealistic, which I'm a, a big fan of. So we have the opportunity to have a chat with Camille. Welcome to our chat. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. So I would love to hear what work with data is uh, with your own words. Uh, if you could walk us through what the business is, why you started this company and the surrounding details. Yeah, sure. Um, so at work with data, we are creating the interface for people building the future on open data. So open data is a huge movement with over the past years, many, many organisms publishing data. Uh, and when I say organisms, it's governments, but it's also museums, libraries, World Bank. So there's a huge amount of data that's available and that could have a huge impact on people's lives. And this data, unfortunately, we found, is not used to the extent it should be. And this mainly is because it's, it's chaotic to work with this data. First, if you want to use this data, you need to have time because you need to look at different sources. You need to have skills so because you need to extract this data. You need to clean it to pre-process it. It's very complex. And this is even before being able to do anything with it, before doing any analysis. So what we wanted to do is to fix this issue with open data. And that's why we created this interface where people can directly find the open data that we've been worked, working with, that we have pre-processed, we have prepared, we have put in nice format, we have cleaned, and directly on our interface, they can interact with it. So they can create a data set that uh, fills exactly the criteria they're looking for, or they can even create graphs in maybe 30 seconds directly on our platform, and then download this data or this graph so that they can work with it. So anyone with our interface, at least that's what we're aiming to do, can work with this open data that's everywhere and that nobody is using currently. What you are doing uh, reminds me of the early days of the internet for some reason. Yeah, and, and it's a bit one of the, the beginning of where everything comes, where everything began. You know, with the internet, everyone was thinking, everyone is going to access information on everything. People are going to be better informed. They will take smarter decisions. But in between, we lost a bit track of it. And if you looked at all the issues that have been surrounding data over the past years, it's, it's really sad. I mean, personally, I, I, I find it really sad, all those uh, data leak, privacy issues. And data has been used badly. I mean, not in the best way, but there's so much more that could be done with data. And I do think, I, I truly believe that open data is the solution to this. The more open you are, the more transparent, uh, the better it is. And that's what we're trying to do, you know, uh, putting data back in the right direction. I couldn't agree more. Some of your some of your resources that I'm seeing on your site are from MoMA to NASA to British Library, John Hopkins, uh, Harvard, uh, the UK government, the World Bank. And so you have a, a quite uh, an, a World Health Organization and so on. You have quite an abundance of resources that you collect the data from. But I, I think I would like to talk about perhaps the philosophy of um, th th this business model, um, the, the way the world is uh, changing. And I think that's a fascinating conversation. But I think before we go there, it would make a lot of sense to understand what the business model you have uh, here with, with this company is, uh, just for the people who are kind of wondering about the same thing, perhaps. So how does this make money, right? Uh, sorry for the blunt question, uh, but I think this is particularly interesting to approach because that seems to be the main dilemma. Same with the um, uh, open source movement as well, right? On the yes. one hand, we have amazing value creation, opening up innovation. That's why I said the, like the early days of the internet, that enthusiasm, you know, that excitement uh, just to share it with the world, create something valuable. And on the other hand, we have this 
incredibly commercialized landscape, not only in, in, in this area, but I was just watching a, um, a short documentary on YouTube yesterday about gaming. It is the exact same situation, hyper monetized and in, in other areas as well. So let's talk a bit about the commercial side of this business and then we can go into other domains. Yes, and definitely it's a, it's a topic that's very important and that's very complex when you work with this open data, um, with open data, how to monetize it. So what we've done is we are giving out for free the data that's uh, from open data source. So if you want to, uh, to access the data from World Bank, you can create graphs with it on our, on our platform or interface without any fees. However, we have upgraded we have two types of upgrades on this data. And for these upgrades, we are charging our customers. So the first uh, upgrade that we have is some intelligence on the uh, graphs that are being created. So if you create a graph uh, like an analysis of the inflation in the world over the past 30 years, yeah. what we do is automatically we do a, a smart um, analysis on it. So mm. we will do either some forecasting or depending on the type of graph, some outlier um, analysis and to access this piece of intelligence that we have created then you need to have a monthly subscription which is around 20 pounds per month so this Amazing. is the first upgrade the second upgrade is more on the data so open data is amazing but sometimes it's inconsistent and it's not complete so we are enriching the data uh, and we are uh, filling it with our own uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. So for instance, if you take data of companies, so you have a lot of data about companies worldwide and some companies are, are public. And for those ones, you have the revenues that they're making and the number of employees. But for private companies, this information, it's not, it's not open, it's not public. Nobody has this information except the, the business itself. So what we've done is we've developed a machine learning algorithm that's able to predict the number of employees and the number and the revenue for all companies, uh, private uh, and all the private companies. So this information, if you want to access it, then you need to uh, to have tokens. So you buy monthly; it's a subscription as well to get tokens. And depending on the number of, co of tokens you have, you can download uh, a number of rows containing this information that we have created using machine learning. Amazing. So. Do, do you think this would be accurate to say, yes, uh, what you're doing is using open resources and uh, combining data in a way, uh, collating it and, and, and then uh, processing it in a way so it's intelligible for people. Uh, so it is open in that sense, but it's not open in the sense that it is free for everyone. Is that accurate? So the data that we get free from, uh, from open data movement this one, you can access it for free without any restriction. But when we do on top of it machine learning algorithm to enrich and to make it better and more complete, for this data, yes, you need to, you need to pay. But, but we're think... not taking open data from the MoMA and making you pay to get access to this data. I see, I see. I mean, uh, I think that's absolutely fair. But to, to be honest, uh, if, if I'm getting access to data, which is going to save me time, resources, and help me make better decisions, I'm all for it. Yeah, I... I, and I mean, it's, it's always a, a complex balance to find on what you can charge for and what you cannot. But for us, definitely, the, the main mission that we have is to make people work with data, with open data, to make this data used um, by people. So we don't want to charge people for that. Yeah. Um, which makes sense for us. What we want is really to spread the data, fix open data. And then on top of this, we are adding values, we're adding intelligence, and that part we're charging. But the data uh, itself from the beginning, we're not. Um, for anyone listening uh, to our chat right now, I would strongly urge them to visit uh, the website because I think it's it's just uh, quite fun to play around with, uh, workwithdata.com, and uh, it's quite interesting. Which makes me think, uh, Camille, is like do you, do you remember this idea of uh, it was it was quite popularized uh back in the early 2000s build it and they will come type of a mentality uh that <laughs> again referring back to the early days of the inter of the internet is that was kind of the mentality because it was such an open landscape like there wasn't anything 
imagine it like a desert and then there is a gold rush and a lot of people are rushing in and there's just simply nothing and then you just build a pub uh, or a saloon or like a stable and because there's a lot of traffic people will come and it used to work it it really used to work you you would build something and then you would get traffic now i think it has kind of flipped uh, we are kind of in a scenario where you can actually build something that is amazing but uh, some of those things are never heard about never seen never noticed by people because we are so overwhelmed with um content coming from every direction and everything competing for our time so that seems to be a bottleneck for some businesses now you build it and sometimes uh they do not come like what do you think about this uh, this this particular aspect i would love to hear your thoughts yeah definitely it's it's a risk because i mean specifically for us at work with data we i mean to be honest we find it very cool what we've built we find it very interesting but of course we always want if people don't come that's then it's useless and i mean our goal again is to have people use this data if people don't use it and don't come to a platform uh I mean, we would have not fulfilled what we want to do. So it's definitely a key aspect of our website, getting traffic, getting traction. And that's why this kind of opportunity to be able to present our product and our vision, it's, it's amazing because it makes it's making some noise and it's necessary. But yeah, to have people working with us on work with data, it's a key aspect for us to make the platform as easy to use as uh, not entertaining, but yeah, easy to handle. And we're we're doing a lot of stuff on this. For instance, we've built uh, communities where instead of being overwhelmed by you know every content created on the platform by other people, you can join a community on a specific topic, so that you can just follow this community and uh, see what this community is is, um, is building. So instead of being overwhelmed by all the open data on on our platform about uh, inflation, environment, and so on. You would go on your community page, for instance, on art, and there you would see the content only on art. Uh, it's a way of filtering out a little bit and being able to find what what is interesting for you. That's amazing. Uh, so, how how do you define your ideal persona? Which people are you trying to reach exactly? Yes. So basically, for us, any person who wants to use data could find and should find what they need on our platform. Uh, and we really want to make it easy. So you don't need skills, technical skills. It's very important for us that non-technical person need to be able to use our platform. Um, of course, if you want to be, I mean, the, the ideal persona is someone who is a bit passionate about data and knowledge in general. If you're not interested at all into seeing graphs, uh, I mean, of course, it's not going to be the right platform for you. But other than this, um, you should find what you need on work with data. And I think we've seen it recently, especially during COVID. Actually, a lot of people enjoy watching graphs and understanding what's going on. Every day, I had, you know, even my father was, was I mean, not the youngest person on earth, of course, who was looking every day at graphs about number of cases declining or increasing, trying to understand the difference between the variation and so on. So there's a lot of people, a, a huge number of people we actually could find it interesting to look at graphs and, and use data. But for the moment, the real issue is how to access it and how to play with this data easily without technical skills. What makes you particularly interested in, in, in building this, but not something else? So with that, uh, maybe tell us a bit about your background. What, uh, what in life has brought you to this moment? Yeah, so originally I studied engineering. So I've always been interested, you know, on the technical part of thing. Mathematics was a huge thing for me when I was younger. Uh, so I, of course, when data came around, it was very interesting for me. I loved coding. Uh, I loved doing analysis. But on the more personal side, I, I'm really of a, I mean, I love trivia. I love quizzes. I spend hours on Wikipedia, you know, reading things because I, I love doing this kind of thing. I, I'm quite curious, let's say. Um, and I'm very interested into theater, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only geeky things. And it was also a way of putting all of this together. You know, especially during COVID, I realized that I love data. I mean, I was working uh, with data before. And many people wanted 
were interested by the output of it, but to get from the data to the output, it was quite complex. Uh, so that's a bit where the, the idea came from, how to, you know, uh, spread the news about open data and how amazing it is, even for people without technical skills, using my skills, which are technical. Uh, do you have any co-founders? How many people are you working with? And um, if I might ask, how long has it taken for you to build this product? Yeah, so we're two. We're two co-founders. Uh, Laurent is the second one. Uh, we were working together uh, with data uh, uh, in an advertising technology company. Uh, we had been working for five years together. He also has an engineering background, but also with a bit of entrepreneurship. So he's a bit more um, used to entrepreneurship than, than I am. And we began working on this as a side project during COVID, co the, the lockdowns. It was a bit our, I mean, our hobby uh, during the night when we were a bit bored with Netflix, more or less. And, <laughs> very productive hobby. <laughs> very productive one. <laughs> and uh, in the end, we quit our job last December, uh, so nine months ago. And then we've been full-time on this since then, working on creating this first iteration, creating an MVP, an interface that was working, getting some first sources of data ingested into our knowledge graph and doing first, you know, communication, getting first clients. So now we're at the end of this first loop, let's say. We have the interface, the business model in place, uh, our first clients testing. Um, and yeah, it's been nine months, nine full months. Um, so how are you sustaining the business financially? Do you have enough clients, enough uh, of a user base that is providing a meaningful revenue for you to sustain this? Or do you have uh, an external source of investment, such as a seed round or something similar? Yeah, so for the moment, we're not yet into the seed round. It's something that we're planning to do in the coming months uh, to get uh, to get funding, because for the moment, we, are get, we have first clients, so we have first uh, source of revenues that are not yet balancing the cost, for instance, of servers and so on. And uh, yeah, in the coming months, we will be looking for more investment to be able to accelerate, uh, get more people on board, of course, and be able to go uh, further and faster. Uh, one of the particular things that kind of surprised me uh, in, in similar projects that I have, because I have interviewed a lot of founders, uh, as, as you're aware, and I have myself worked as a founder with some companies, The going back uh, to pre the previous question that I have uh, raised, uh, build it and they will come mentality and, and, and the change that's happening around that. Now, the technical challenges are quite valuable to solve. And I think this is the dilemma of the situation. You, you end up solving an incredible, uh, difficult problem, creating value. But by itself, that does not mean it's a successful business, unfortunately, because you still need for people to be aware of this which then makes the job of the co-founder of the business something different in some cases than what they thought it would be in the beginning. Um, if, if I don't know if that makes sense, but basically you start out as, a, for some people, they start out as a CTO and then they turn into a growth marketer, which they focus on content, uh, reach outs, and so on. So I think growing the business uh, is an inevitable necessity for any startup wherever it is. And some businesses, I think, are, are lucky enough to find a, a sudden streak of, of growth. Like their product is so good, they, they catch a wave of virality and then it grows from there. But some for, for, for most of the startups, in my experience, that's not the case. And they have to do manual actions, let's say, in terms of driving traffic. So what are your thoughts on how a founder, in your case, in this in this company, work with data, or let's talk about the company resources. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Uh, what percentage of com of your company's resources are you planning to focus on growth and marketing and content and uh, and reach out efforts? And what percentage of it should be dedicated for the engineering side of it? Yes, uh, it's a very interesting question, and it's definitely a key topic for us. Uh, it, it definitely rings a bell what you were saying about co-founders that begin doing a bit of everything, which is the case for us because at the beginning we were both, uh, so Laurent and I, working on the interface and the coding part. So we spent a lot of time uh, doing technical things because it's a technical project. We need to, you know, we needed to validate the technicality that it was possible. And now we are at the stage, the product is here. 
we have valuable things and we need to get more traffic. We need to have uh, to reach out to people. So right now it's definitely something we've been focusing on over the past months to get those first clients. So reaching out to you know people we know that could be interested in data, presenting them uh, our solution. We've been working a lot, of course, uh, with SEO to be able to be found online because if you're not good at SEO, the I mean it's it's that it's a necessity. You need to be good at SEO. So I would say over the the past months, maybe half of the resource of the company has been focused on um, commercial marketing, uh, SEO. Um, and communication in general. And it's, I, I think it's normal. The more mature you are, the more you need also to focus on this as soon as the technical part is not done because it's never done, but as soon as you have a basis that's strong enough for you to reach out to new people. That, that's what I was planning to ask you. Uh, are you are you incorporating the SEO efforts in, into this? Because it seems it's a big part of the problem there. Uh, and it comes down to finding the growth channels which work best for your company. And for every company, I think it's different. For some companies, it's direct outreach. For some of them, it is uh, the Google search engine results. For example, we've benefited hugely from that. And it it really depends on the business. It's, I think, a, a huge part of the job itself of becoming an entrepreneur is finding the growth channels which will get your business, get your value in, to, in front of the eyes of the people who might potentially use it. And then you need to delight them with a great product. So how do you think uh, in, in that sense, uh, now we focus on the first part, which is kind of driving the traffic and so on. Um, and it is your challenge to figure out. So I wish you the best of luck with that. <laughs> but perhaps the second part of it is once people, enough people are aware of it, um, how do you delight your users, right? How do you create an experience that is positive to play around with, that they keep coming back to, that they, like there's a word of mouth, they keep recommending to their friends and so on. And I yes. I have a gut feeling data visualization is some part of it, but I don't really know. So tell us about, about that part. How do you plan around making sure your users uh, stick with the site and, and make sure they recommend it to others? and have a yes. great experience while doing so. So for us, the key really has been user feedback. With that kind of product, as you say, we need people to come back. We need people to have a, an enjoyable experience on the website. And this cannot be done without getting to know your users, getting feedback from them, discussing with them. So we've been spending a lot of time, first with, of course, friends, people around us, just showing them our interface, letting them play with them with it, and seeing, okay, what works, what doesn't work. This, what keeps their attention? What is the thing that they like, they like the most? And so we've been talking a lot about it. We've been listening to people. We've been watching a lot of people just interacting with the platform. And this has been the resource that we are using to make this experience enjoyable. So this is the one of the main components, this user research that a necessity. And I, I do believe that as a startup, you cannot build something great or even good if you don't get uh, the feedback from your users. A hundred percent. It's a necessity. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you have to live, breathe and ask uh, with your users. But I've so, also seen, sorry to be kind of critical about this, but I think I, I care about this. That's why I'm approaching it from this angle, you see. Uh, sometimes users do not always give the best responses when it comes to um, designing things, especially at a at a user experience level. So how do you how do you resolve that dilemma? Yes, so of course feedback is not perfect and people don't always know as well. So what we've done on top of that is we've also been talking with uh, contacts, reaching out to people that work on in design. So we've been doing interviews with those people who are a bit more experienced and who have who have a bit more knowledge about uh, uh, UX and so on, design, how to make it work. Uh, and those people have been very helpful, giving us some hints, some ideas. We've been reading as well, you know, online. There's a lot of resources online. So we spend some time looking for this uh, so that by itself, it's not enough. But if you have users feedback, plus some uh, knowledge online, plus some experts advice, then in the end, it's, it forms a consistent, uh, a consistent help. Uh, and you take a bit of everywhere, uh, feedback from a bit of everywhere, 
and in the end you you use it that's amazing that's amazing i mean there's a lot of opportunity in this space i think i've seen success with companies that co- focus on commercial side of the data for example um they, their their way of thinking goes around something like who would pay most in a way to put it again very uh crudely uh, for the data and then they come to a conclusion like oh, okay uh, real estate uh, would would pay m- most for this because it's an area where a one percent difference can mean a twenty thousand pounds right yeah. so they 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 start curating data around real estate and then they folk and then they jump to different industries like this now one of the experiences i had when i was browsing your site was i could not see an area of focus which is perhaps a strength perhaps a vulnerability what do you think about this aspect of this yes yeah, so it's something that we've decided from the beginning what we wanted was really to be a layer for open data so we want any person who's interested in data to to come and find the data that they need without being topic agnostic um so that's why we we really don't want to have a focus and what we do is we are developing stuff based on user feedback So the first traction we had with first clients were about campaign data. So we worked a lot on on this. Um and now we have a lot of people telling us, "Oh yes, environment is a key topic for us. We need data. Yes. It's complex to find." So we use this feedback to um to develop our platform to to increase our coverage and data. Uh but yeah, the the goal is definitely not to have uh just one industry uh, because that's that's not the vision that that we have. I agree with you. It's just a challenge. Uh, I think that's going to be in your path in the coming days. Yeah. Uh, and I think when you focus on one topic, mm-hmm. then you need to create by yourself to become an expert on this topic because the value you have is then um creating some expertise on that. For us, we are not having expertise on the topics. We let our users build what they want. We empower them with the data. They are the experts that are creating. Yeah. And you have uh, some interesting content there. For example, I'm looking at most popular data sets, and then you have companies using Shopify, and then oil paintings, and then far right parties, and then books by Agatha Christie, and then cities in Japan. So it's just uh, it's from a lot of totally unrelated bits of data that are, I'm sure, interesting by themselves. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's 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 a very large spread which might really work out the risk with that is then that there's always it's always easier to curate for something of a for, for a specific persona and make sure that they have a great experience versus being this resource for all parties and everyone it's just a steeper incline to climb i think to start with for most startups that i'm seeing but i i think this is totally exciting it's just uh, one aspect of it that i've seen other startups struggle with so that's i I'm, i'm kind of warning you in that sense maybe in a way <laughs> thanks but i think there's huge potential there so i would like to come a circle back before we wrap up to your experience as an entrepreneur so this is your first startup uh, I, I, am i right and your your founder have uh, worked on other startups before so yeah it is my first startup and uh, and my founder was working yes in the in the industry of startups in uh, ASCP business school in paris So I would just like to ask so far in your journey what has uh, surprised you what was unexpected for you that uh, you perhaps thought it would happen different and so on I would love to hear your personal journey on that as we wrap up Yeah I think what has been the most surprising would be the things the extent of things that you learn at a very fast pace I was not expecting to learn that much in a bit less than a year because you know I was thinking yes I'm going to create this startup I'm going to work on this data and it's going to be amazing and then you discover that building a company is so much more than this that you know you do a bit of finance you do a bit of accounting then you do a bit of communication and all of this you have absolutely no experience and and everything depends on just how re- resilient you are so yeah I learned a lot about just resilience and being able to go on and try and not being an expert but but being okay by with not being an expert but just going on and carrying on as so I I found it very very interesting and you discover a lot of strength I think when you're in that kind of situation and yeah I love that and also a second point that I just thought about is second surprising thing is how non-linear it is to develop a startup 
because when you hear in the press about startups raising millions and millions, it's always very easy. Like we had an idea and we've made it and directly we get the money, we get the clients. But behind the scenes, it's so much more, so much more trying something than getting feedback. So you change the thing and you update your vision and, and little by little, by little steps, you get somewhere, but it's not as linear as what I thought it would be. But yeah, it's very enriching. You are a hundred percent right on, on, on that. And I think it's a, like you beautifully put, it's, it's non-linear uh, and it's just, uh, it's just a mess. The, the process of building any company, any startup is, is perhaps similar for a lot of uh, complex and creative other type of endeavors, but uh, this is what we know. So I, I can definitely agree hundred percent with that. What happens, I think, is because of the way the human brain works and the way we process time and the way we process causality we need desperately from the from the standpoint of an audience to hear it in the form of a story so it makes sense for us right yes. so the media essentially presents it as this this story with uh, a, a a logical clear beginning a causation and then a result and then it ends up happening like oh we had an idea we built it we got money we have customers we are successful but in reality it is perhaps infinitely more complex than that with thousands of variables spinning in their place and then you as the founder are desperately trying to bring them together in an, into a coherent whole yeah t- totally yeah Camille thank you for joining in the podcast uh, I, I loved having you here uh, I wish you the best and your f- co-founder with work with data I think what you are doing is definitely it reminds me with that romanticism of the early days of the internet where like people have ambitious goals and trying to create valuable things. Thank you for joining in. And I hope you inspire some other people as well who have listened to the podcast. Thank you very much, Ozan. It was great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you.